Chapter 37 Surprise The sky was black as the small plane headed for a beach landing on the Wessel Islands, a 200 kilometre chain that stretched out from Australia's northern coast. Dana had found herself a single seat at the back, two rows clear of Eve and Nina. She knew there was a chance Aces had successfully tracked the flight and had a team waiting to ambush them when they landed, but she doubted it. Most likely, everyone would assume that Barry Cox had cancelled the attack and gone to ground after discovering that his team was under surveillance. So it was all down to Dana. At first, the idea scared her. She didn't know anything about tankers or LNG facilities, but guessed that there had to be at least 50 lives at stake. The longer she sat at the back of the plane in her trademark position, arms folded, legs outstretched, thinking about it, the more confident she got. Cherub training teaches you that surprise is everything. Barry had thrown her off stride with the double murder and the sudden revelation that the attack was going to take place in a different country, a thousand kilometres from where everyone was expecting it but she'd have surprise on her side during the four-hour ride to Indonesia. Once the boat was underway, people would let their guard down. Maybe even try getting some sleep if things weren't too tense. Dana didn't have any weapons, but reckoned she'd find plenty on a boat. Fishing hooks, ropes, kitchen utensils in the galley. Dana was 15 and had lived on Cherub campus since she was seven. She'd been baked, frozen, half-drowned and shot at during training exercises. She'd read 800-page computer hacking textbooks, learned to speak Russian and had her nose rubbed in puke by a sadistic training instructor. But all she had to show for it were a string of missions that had fizzled out or only been partially successful. Now Dana had a chance to prove it had all been worthwhile. She felt like the last eight years of her life had all been building up to what was going to happen in the next few hours. Chloe sat in a car at the roadside, with the ark glowing serenely two kilometres ahead. There was no hint of the brewing trouble. The helicopter attack was due in nine minutes. She had a satellite phone at her ear, and could barely hear the man talking to her because his voice was being patched through from a helicopter that was 30 kilometres off, but closing in rapidly. Why won't you listen to me? Chloe shouted. There are more than 100 children inside the Ark. I have two undercover operatives who have positively identified an array of heavy weaponry. We're aware of their capability, miss, the TAG unit commander shouted back patronisingly. This raid has been planned carefully. We've been in training for two months. You're not listening to me, Chloe yelled, growing increasingly exasperated. I have reason to believe that Joel Regan is dead. You're attacking at the worst possible time. The Ark has been locked down tight and the survivors are in an emergency state of readiness. Well, I haven't received any such intelligence Yes, you have. I just told you. From credible sources, the commando added sourly. We've trained for this raid. We're an elite unit. Now, I know you're worried about your undercover operatives, but this plan has been authorised at prime ministerial level. Chloe groaned. Is there anyone from ASIS up there in the chopper with you? The tag commander seemed only too happy to get Chloe off his back and handed the radio across without another word. Who are you exactly? The ACES officer asked stiffly. Chloe wasn't about to reveal the existence of Cherub to a helicopter full of commandos. I'm on attachment from British intelligence, she explained. I have two agents inside the Ark and they're telling me that Eleanor Regan has issued weapons to every able-bodied adult. If you go into that arc tonight, you're going to face a significantly 
I repeat, significantly more hostile reaction than the one you're expecting. Miss Blake, the ACES officer said bluntly. I'm not even aware of any undercover operation inside the Ark, and there's no way we can pull out at this stage. If you're still in contact with your undercover officers, I suggest you tell them to find refuge. The raid will commence in five minutes. If you feel we're behaving inappropriately, you can file an official complaint after the event. Asshole! Chloe gasped, losing her temper. I just hope you live that long. Chloe ended the call and threw the satellite phone down on the passenger seat in frustration. After a groan, she grabbed another radio that was resting on the glove box flap. James, do you copy? Loud and clear. What's going on? Are they still coming? Looks that way, Chloe said. Eight on the dot. What's your situation? Same as, James said. Eleanor put out an announcement over the Tanoi that Joel died and told everyone to protect themselves from the possible attack by devils. Everyone here is tooled up and running around dressed like action man. When they hear those choppers, they're going to think it's the bloody apocalypse. What kind of weapons are you seeing? Automatic rifles mostly, James said. AK-47s, M16 carbines. There's heavier stuff being set up inside the turrets. 20 millimeter cannons and rocket propelled grenades. Where are you now? We're in a classroom on the first floor of the adult education center. Rat took us here because it's deserted. It's been mothballed since they stopped letting guests inside the ark. Okay, Chloe said. Can you find somewhere with better cover? Like an underground bunker or something? Yeah, James said. Rat says there's a bunch of tunnels right under here, but we won't be able to see what's going on once we're down there. I wouldn't worry about that, Chloe said. We've got total communication breakdown. The Special Forces Commando won't listen to me, and the ASIS officers up there haven't been briefed on the Cherub mission. In the end, I lost my rag and ended up swearing at them. That's not like you, James said. Sheer bloody frustration, Chloe groaned. Just get yourselves undercover, keep calm, keep safe, and don't try anything stupid. Would I? James said making a weak stab at humour, even though he felt more like throwing up from nerves. I'll be in touch as soon as there's something to tell you. Chloe took the radio away from her ear. For a moment, she thought she'd left the volume on and was listening to static. Then she realised it was the distant pulsing of helicopter blades. She looked at the digital clock in the dashboard. 7.57pm. The beach was illuminated with flood lamps, powered from a diesel generator. Barry made a gentle landing on sand levelled out by the outgoing tide. As Dana unbuckled her seatbelt, a man dressed in deck shoes and loud shorts came jogging towards the small aircraft. She'd not met Mike Evans before, so she had no idea it was him. As they clambered from the aircraft onto the dark beach and walked the stiffness out of their legs, Mike shook Barry's hand and spoke with a Texan accent. Hey Barry, y'all set? So far so good, Barry nodded. What's been going on up here? Your boat's all set to run, weather is good, the sea couldn't be any calmer, so you can drive her flat out if needs be. But watch the fuel gauges, because you're squirting 8 litres a minute into the turbines when she goes above 50 knots, and you won't make it back to Oz at that rate. What about the radar? Nina added. Not a dicky bird, Mike said. The systems on that boat are state of the art. There is nothing unexpected on the screen, either in the sea or up in the air. I'm 99% sure nobody followed you out of Darwin. Mike turned his head towards the girls before continuing. And why haven't you introduced me to these two beautiful young ladies? 
Barry smiled. This is Eve and Dana, and I'm extremely proud to have them on our team tonight. Mike grinned and shook both their hands. Are you coming on the boat with us? Dana asked, not happy at the prospect of having another crewmate to take out. I'm sure your company would be a delight, but I'm going to see you off in the boat. Then I'm going to pack up the landing lights and fly the plane out of here. That's a pity, Dana lied, creeped out by the way Mike was flirting with her. Mike led everyone on a trek across the beach. They walked for a couple of minutes when they reached a wooden jetty with a large powerboat moored off the end. It was dark, so they were less than 20 metres away from the boat when Dana got a proper look. It was extremely cool, in a menacing kind of way. Twin black hulls with chromed deck fittings. The whole shape was streamlined for high speed, and a dinghy, identical to the one they trained in that morning, was lashed to a ramp at the end of the rear deck. Eve and Dana straddled over the deck rail and climbed aboard. As Barry ran up a flight of steps to the bridge, Mike began unwinding the ropes tethering the boat to the jetty. Free to go, Mike shouted, standing to attention and saluting the three females. Good luck out there. The catamaran lurched as the turbine inside each hull gulped down the water it would propel out of the stern in a high-speed jet. As Dana headed into the mess room beneath the bridge, Barry cranked up the power and two blasts of spray erupted five metres into the air behind the boat. 